Hola, my name is Maya. In English, I'm called a Western Sandpiper, and in Spanish, I'm called Playerito. I'm making a 5,000 mile journey to Alaska. I have seen the wetlands of Alaska and flew down to Mexico last fall. My brothers and sisters and all of my friends live in Mexico during the winter. Each time we fly north, there are fewer safe places to rest and eat. We fly between our summer and winter homes each year to find food. On the way, we stop at our favorite resting place, the Copper River Delta of Alaska. Come with me now and explore my wetland world. Welcome to Winging Northward, a shorebird's journey. My name is Sandy Frost. Today we have thousands of students at 760 sites across the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, and Mexico participating in today's electronic field trip. And the world is watching live over the internet via a webcast. It's also being translated into Spanish for our friends and neighbors to the south. We welcome you all. Hi there, I'm Hillary Chapman, and we're coming to you live right now from Hilton High School in Prince William County, Virginia. And joining in this, us in the studio today is Ellen Poppy's fourth grade class from Mullen Elementary School. We're going to have Miss Poppy's students help us with a few things later in the program. Also assisting us in the studio is Ron Archuleta. He's a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service. Hi, Ron. Hi, Hillary and Cindy. It's great to be here today, and it's great to be a part of a shorebird's journey. I'm looking forward to handling all of the emails that will be coming in from classrooms across the Western Hemisphere for today's program. Fabulous. Thank you. Through the use of technology and satellites, we are linked live with the Copper River Delta near Cordova, Alaska, where students, teachers, and biologists are going to show you their very special part of the world and see shorebirds up close. It's the height of migration season, and we will have the chance to see thousands of shorebirds. Hi, everyone. How's the weather? Hi, Hi, Pam. Everybody. It's great. The sun's just coming up through the clouds and just coming up for the mountains. I think it's going to be a great day of birding. Oh, it looks beautiful. Great day in Cordova. Hi, Dan. Hi, Pam. Hi, Irene. Wow. Fabulous. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. We'll be joining them in just a few moments. First, let me tell you who Hillary and I work for. We work for you. We work for America's public lands, places that belong to everybody. And we teach people about creatures that make their homes in national forests and in national wildlife refuges. Today's program gives us the chance to teach people like you about environmental issues like bird migration and protecting wetland habitats. So are you ready for our begin our exciting trip? You're going to visit some cool places and meet some great new friends on our virtual adventure. And you'll have the chance to have your questions answered by our expert biologist. Each of you will also be invited to participate in our live game contest. So pay close attention because you can win prizes if you figure out the correct answers. We'll explain more later. Sandy. But but first, we want to talk about what you'll learn today and why it's so important. We're going to learn about a shorebird's journey. Let's begin our journey by introducing you to these little guys. Have you ever seen a shorebird before? Shorebirds are a special type of bird. They have long legs, long pointed wings, and they live in wet habitats called wetlands and, you guessed it, along the shore. These guys are western sandpipers, a type of shorebird. They're about six and a half inches long and have brown backs and black bills and feet. If you visited this program's website, you probably have met Maya, a western sandpiper, and followed her journey up the Pacific Coast Flyway. Now, if you didn't have the chance to visit the website, don't worry. You'll learn plenty about western sandpipers and other shorebirds throughout today's program. One of the most astounding things about shorebirds is their ability to fly thousands of miles each year. They make international journeys to their summer and winter homes. We'll talk much more about migration in the next hour, but for starters, most types of shorebirds winter or spend the cold months in Central and South America and migrate north in the spring. Gosh, that's nearly 5,000 miles that these little birds fly every spring. Maya and many other western sandpipers winter in Sinaloa, Mexico and head to the Arctic tundra to breed each spring. We'll learn more about Sinaloa, Mexico later in the program. Western sandpipers and all shorebirds must have a very good reason to fly so many miles. 
and we'll learn more about why they do it later on. Hillary, can you show us the routes shorebirds travel when they migrate? Certainly. Um, Sandy and everyone, uh, the routes that shorebirds travel are called flyways. These are paths in the sky that the, shores, uh, the shorebirds follow during migration. Well, let's take a look at this map. You'll see the flyways here. There's generally three flyways that go through the United States. This is the Atlantic Flyway, the Central Flyway, and the Pacific Flyway. And for today's broadcast, we're going to be focusing on the Pacific Flyway. And just so you understand, the birds don't follow these lines exactly. They actually disperse throughout, but more or less, they follow these, these general routes. Just to help get you rounded, right here today, we're live in the studio here in Virginia. Our broadcast that's going to be in Alaska is right here in Cordova, Alaska. And then you guys out here watching us are all across the United States, Canada, even we have folks watching from Puerto Rico and Mexico. Can you see where you might be on that map? All right, getting back to shorebirds. As we said, Maya and western sandpipers begin their journey from Sinaloa, Mexico. But there are many other shorebirds and shorebird species that actually winter, that is, spend their time during the winter resting and feeding here in Central America and then throughout South America as well. Then on about March or April, these birds begin to migrate north. And for our western sandpipers, they cruise along the Pacific Flyway, going far, 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 all the way up to the northern Arctic tundra of Alaska. But what's really critical and crucial here is the chain of wetlands that they must stop at to get enough uh, food and a chance to uh, rest before they continue on. And for western sandpipers, the Copper River Delta, right here, where we're going to be live today, is the most important resting spot for shorebirds. And over the last several weeks, hundreds of thousands of migratory shorebirds have been arriving in the Copper River Delta, which is near Cordova, Alaska. Sandy? Oh, and speaking of Alaska, our friends in the last frontier are ready to show us some shorebirds. Fabulous. You bet. Let's go to the Copper River Delta on the Chugach National Forest now, where Dan Logan and a class from Mount Eccles Elementary School in Cordova are standing by. Now to you, Dan. Hey, Sandy and Hillary. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Copper River Delta near Cordova, Alaska. My name's Dan Logan, and I'm a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service here on the Chugach National Forest. Hola y todos. Y bienvenidos a Delta de Rio Cupra, cerca de Cordova, Alaska. Now the Chugach has about six million acres in size, and it's most northern and most western out of any national forest in the United States. But you know what's really cool about this place? Is that every year you can stand right here, and you can't see them really good today. The birds are a little bit camera shy, I think. But off in the distance, on a normal day, you can see these clouds kind of moving back and forth and east and west. Well, those are western sandpipers, thousands of them. Now those birds just got here and they're pretty tired because they've been on a tremendous journey. They've come from as far south as Mexico, Central America, and even all the way down in South America. Now these birds here, they'll be followed by about five million other birds that'll stop and stage here on the Copper River Delta. Now when they stage, they stop and they kind of work around these mud flats here and they feed on Macoma clams and amphipods that we'll be talking about later in the show. And then after about five days, they'll migrate north to the breeding ground on the tundra. They still got a long ways to go, because Alaska is a huge state. If you look at this state, over half of it's owned by all of us. It's public land. Now it's managed by a variety of federal agencies. The Copper River Delta here is managed by the U.S. Forest Service. But there's also another land manager in the Copper River Delta, and that's the native people of EAC. A lot of Alaska is owned by the native people. Now today, we're really lucky, because we have Irene Hansen with us. And Irene's an elder with the native village of EAC. Hi, Irene. Hi. My name is Irene Hansen. Welcome to the Copper River Delta. I am a descendant of the Eyak people. The Eyak have lived off the bounty of the coastal waters, rivers, and lands for thousands of years. Like the Eyak ancestors, today our way of life depends on the salmon that live in the wetlands. It's important that the native village of Eyak and the Forest Service protect the delta for the birds, fish, and other animals. Thanks, Irene. Now I'd like to introduce two other amazing people. One is Pam Vandenbroek. She's a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service here on the Chugach National Forest. And the other one is our student host, Mariah Cordona. Hi, guys. Hi, Dan. Thanks. Welcome to the Cop River Delta. I'm Pam Vandenbroek, and I grew up near the Cop River Delta. 
Every spring, I've watched the shorebirds return to this place. And now, I'm excited for you to get the opportunity to learn about shorebirds and to visit this important stopover site. The Copper River Delta is the largest undisturbed wetland on the Pacific coast of North America. It's an enormous wetland. Mariah, who did you bring with you today to help us learn about shorebirds? My teacher and my fifth grade class. We're glad that you can come and join us. Thanks, Mariah. We're going to meet Teacher Jay Bowden, Mariah's classmates, and our invertebrate expert, Belle Mickelson, in a bit. First, we're going to send you back to Virginia, where you'll find out how to play a cool game and what we're going to learn today. Thanks, Pam and Mariah. Boy, that really sounds great. We'll be back with you soon. Why don't we ask members of Ellen Poppy's class to read the questions that we'll investigate today. How are shorebirds adapted for wetland habitats? How do shorebirds prepare for their migratory journeys? Why is healthy chain of wetlands important to shorebird migration? How can I help protect shorebirds and their wetland environments? Now, before we move on, it's time to begin our interactive game and contest. Now, it works like this. During the program, four clues will be given, and you must work together with your classmates to fill in the blanks. The first class to email in the correct answer to each clue will win this cute shorebird puppet for your class, along with two videotapes, one called Celebrating Alaska Shorebirds and the other called The Amazing Journey of the Migrating Shorebirds. You also get this companion booklet for the videotape and a poster to display in your classroom. The email address is pwnetwk at aol.com. And that address will appear on the bottom of the screen throughout the program. So pay really close attention because all the answers will be given before the clues are given. And just to make the game even more fun, we've added another component. When the clues appear on the screen, you'll see that some of the blanks are shaded. This means that when you fill in the blanks, quickly submit your answer to that clue and remember those letters that have been shaded because all the shaded letters in each of the four clues will spell out our mystery slogan. And here it is. After the fourth clue, you should be able to spell out the mystery slogan using all the shaded letters. And the first class to submit the answer to the mystery slogan will win a very special prize. This huge stuffed shorebird from Cordova for your class. Isn't it really cool? This shorebird just flew in directly from Cordova, Alaska. In addition to the big shorebird, you'll receive the two videotapes and materials for your classroom. Now remember to include your class name and where you're from in your email. We'll have the first clue in just a bit. That sounds like a great game, Sandy. I look forward to it. Now let's go back to Alaska where they're going to start an activity that I think you'll enjoy, even though it involves math. Hi, welcome back. There are a lot of birds on the Copper River Delta today. Are you wondering how many? I sure am. We're going to have Mariah's class find out just how many. First, Mariah, let's introduce your teacher. This is Mr. Budden. We've been learning about shorebirds in class. Hi, Mr. Bowden. Now, there, when there are a lot of birds out there, it's tough to count them all. First of all, why do scientists count shorebirds? Um, the reason it's important is we need to document how many shorebirds are coming through this area. Um, we have three-fourths of most of the shorebirds of North America wintering or summering in um, Alaska and the Arctic tundra. Most of them come through here from the Pacific Flyway. Um, Pete Islam, he did a study in the 1970s, and he was taking samplings about every 15 minutes. And at that time, he counted 20 million shorebirds using this area. And so there's been a change in numbers from that time. We're not exactly sure, so it's real important for us to do that. Now, he can't count, and we can't count every bird that comes through here. So what we do is we use little tricks, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later. And what they do is they uh, are able to then do the math to come up with what those birds are we'll see today. So now we know why scientists count shorebirds. And I understand that your students have been practicing to count large flocks before the shorebirds arrived. 
What kinds of activities have you been doing to prepare for this? Well, we did a lot of activities. Um, when we first started, we weren't very good at it, we found out. And so what we did, we started working with, we went down to the harbor, and we started counting um, the intertidal creatures that were attached to the dock that didn't move around too much. So we ran some little transects down there, and we counted those creatures, got pretty good at that. Then we went to counting macaroni and cereal on our desks, and then we started using dots on paper the kids made, and they, they knew how many they had on each one. So they were able to get pretty accurate on that. Then we started using some computer programs that are out there now that helped us um, work with moving flocks of birds. So we got, we got quite a bit better at it. So Mariah, when you were counting shorebird flocks, when you were practicing, what did you do? Well, for me, it was counting in groups of 20, and we practiced a lot, so I got used to it. Cool. So what's next, Mr. Bowden? Well, we're going to take a shorebird safari. Shorebirds have been showing up real good this morning, so we're going to take a little hike, and we'll come back and tell you what we have found when we get there. Great. We're going to hear from the shorebird safari later on. We'll report back to you. Hillary, Sandy? Thanks, Pam. Now, before we move on, it's time to give you the first clue to our game, okay? Are you ready for clue number one? Here it is. Many blank sandpipers like Maya Winter and blank, blank, Mexico. Okay, now remember to fill in the blanks and send your answer to clue number one by email to Ron. The first class to send in the right answer wins. And remember to take the shaded letters and write them down. You'll have to unscramble all those shaded letters from all the clues to spell out our mystery slogan. We'll have the answer to clue number one in just a bit. Great. The game looks like a lot of fun, and I think we may have given the answer to that first clue when I went over flyways earlier in the program. Okay, one of the things we wanted to investigate today is the special adaptations that birds have, especially shorebirds. What characteristics do these little guys wear that allow them to live in wetlands and to migrate thousands of miles each year? Well, Mrs. Poppy's class has spent a lot of time learning about shorebird adaptations, so why don't we ask her? Mrs. Poppy. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Sandy. My class has learned about the special adaptations of shorebirds like Maya. We actually constructed a shorebird so that we could learn about all the different physical traits our feathered friends have. Maybe your class did this activity, too. It's called Build a Shorebird, and we have sped it up for you here, so it looks like we built this shorebird in record time. Take a look.
wow, that was terrific, and I believe that was record time. How cool is that activity? Well, right now, we have Carrie and Jordan here to help us with our next activity, and they're going to tell us how shorebird adaptations are perfect for living in wetland habitat. Long pointed wings. That's right. This type of wing for shorebirds help them fly fast and far during migration. Wouldn't you like to have a pair of wings like these? Long toes and legs. Yep, it's just like being on stilts. Long toes and legs make it easy for these shorebirds to wade in shallow water while they feed. Narrow bills. Shorebirds, well, shorebirds have these nice narrow bills. But did you know that each type of shorebird eats different wetland foods depending on the shape and the length of their bill? Camouflage feathers. The coloring of the shorebirds' feathers is very important to help them blend into wetland habitats like mudflats, the Arctic tundra, and beaches. They hide from falcons and weasels by matching their environment. Thanks, Karen and Ann Jordan. Thank you very much. Remember earlier when Sandy said that shorebirds must have a very good reason for flying so far? Well, they do, and it's for the abundance of food in the Arctic tundra. And they fly so far because of their special adaptations. That makes it possible to migrate from one hab habitat to another on the journeys that may take weeks and cover thousands of miles. Western sandpipers and all shorebirds must have a lot of energy to fly those thousands of miles. But how do they get all that energy? And how do they fly so far? Let's watch a short video on shorebird migration to find out. Migration is one of the most astonishing natural wonders of our world. Why would a western sandpiper, weighing only as much as six quarters, fly 4,000 miles to the Arctic tundra? Well, for food, of course. As seasons change, so does food supply. Shorebirds must migrate from breeding grounds in one climate to those in another climate to ensure they will have the food they need to survive. Shorebirds have a yearly cycle of migration between habitats. They migrate or fly long distances, stopping several times at various wetlands along their flyway. A flyway is a path birds follow to and from their breeding grounds, and it can be a long journey more than 4,000 miles. But how could small birds possibly fly so far? just as you might do before a physical activity, like a soccer game or dance recital, shorebirds fuel up for the long and difficult task of migrating by eating lots of big meals. And we mean lots. Shorebirds and other migratory birds have the amazing ability to almost double their body weight in just a few weeks. Humans can never come close to doubling their weight in a few short weeks. But to get an idea of how much shorebirds eat in preparing to migrate, Imagine eating a barrel of peanut butter and then running a marathon. A person can never consume so much. Only shorebirds have this special adaptation. The extra weight shorebirds put on before migrating serves as stored energy, and you can bet it comes in handy from flying thousands of miles. Migration sounds like a fun adventure. Sure, there's a lot of eating and a lot of flying, but shorebirds face many challenges as they travel from one breeding ground to another. They might encounter dangerous storms or drought conditions. Migrating birds might also find that humans have altered wetland habitats so that they and other species can no longer use them as resting grounds. Predators like cats and falcons pose another threat to migrating shorebirds. And oftentimes, the water supply that migrating birds depend on becomes polluted from oil spills or pesticide runoff from lawns and golf courses. And did you know that four-wheelers, cars, and even people walking along beaches can disturb migrating birds as they feed and rest? It's never an easy journey. There are lots of threats to shorebirds, but fortunately there are people helping them. How? Many organizations and individuals have made it their mission to protect public lands like national forests and national wildlife refuges. Migrating birds can rest and refuel free from many dangers in these protected habitats. And you too can help the shorebirds' annual journey by learning about the birds through research and observation. Wow, see how tough migration can be for these guys? Now let's review. Shorebirds must migrate from one wetland habitat to another in order to ensure that they'll have enough food. We'll learn a lot more about wetland habitats in just a bit. 
But just remember that the migration journey can be very rough, especially if they encounter dangerous storms or drought conditions, or if they're threatened by predators like cats and falcons. And sometimes they're faced with change or the destruction of wetland habitat caused by people. Now imagine if you are used to visiting your grandmother or your friend along a certain route, and then someone came along and ripped down the landmarks or redirected the streets. Would you get lost? When people fill wetlands with gravel and pavement or put buildings on this land, a shorebird can no longer use this area as a resting and feeding ground. We hope you'll take the time to learn more about shorebirds and migration so you can help them have successful journeys. Now the answers have been pouring in for our first clue. Ron, do we have a winner? We do have a winner. There were a lot of quick responses, but the first correct answer came from Pinconning Middle School. Congratulations, Pinconning Middle School. Great. Way to go. Way to go, Pinconny. Okay. Good job. Now, hey, who wants to tell the answer to the clue? Let's take a look at that last clue. Many Western sandpipers like Maya Winter in Sonola, Mexico. Oh, good job. Yes, of course. Maya is a Western sandpiper, and they like to winter in Sinaloa, Mexico. Pinconi uh, uh, Grade School, you've won this really cute shorebird puppet for your class, along with the videotapes and all the other cool stuff. Way to go. Way to go. Okay. Now, remember that you need to take the W, T, and R from Western and the N and L from Sinaloa and save them for your mystery slogan. Okay. Are you ready for our next clue? Here it is. Animals that threaten shorebirds like cats and falcons are examples of what? Okay, think about it, guys. Once you have that answer, email it in quickly. The first class wins a prize. Now don't forget, save those four shaded letters for the mystery slogan. Why don't we go back to the Copper River Delta with Pam and Mariah? Welcome back to the Cop River Delta. While you're busy filling in the blanks on that next clue, we're going to take a closer look on the mud flats here on the Chugach National Forest. Mariah, what are those shorebirds doing in the mud? Well, it looks like they're eating as much as they can. That's right. They're in a big hurry. They're refueling. They're eating a lot to get all the energy ready to continue migrating. What else can we investigate, Mariah? Well, what do shorebirds eat? That's a good question. Tell you what, we have a special guest with us here today, Belle Mickelson, and she's an invertebrate expert. She's been for 20 years teaching about special wetland habitats that shorebirds live in and teaching about them. Hi, Belle. Hi, Pam. Well, in that last video, Belle, we learned that shorebirds nearly double their weight as they make their migrations, so they have enough energy. What do the shorebirds feed on as they're migrating? Well, I'll tell you, these mud flats may not look like mutts, but they look like heaven to shorebirds. <laughs> they can, they are, uh, as you're going to find out, we're going to find clams, worms, amphipods, and a lot more stuff out there that uh, you'll really enjoy. We're going to be using things like this clam shovel. Justin, can you show us your clam shovel? This is uh, what we've used on the Copper River Delta for many years to get our razor clams, uh, but uh, shorebirds have better adaptations to, to get their clams. Um, JJ has a, a rake here that, we're, that you can also use for clams, and we've been using a core sample. Holly's got this, uh, we, we're just using these little cans here to get our core samples and then flushing them through with water uh, going down to the bottom sieve. So um, anyway, this is really a great uh, sampling place and uh, it's pretty exciting to find out what wetlands are really uh, have in them. Great, Belle. We'll find out what those shorebirds are eating later. Better bring your appetites. Sounds good. Now, Mariah, you can see that wetland habitats like the Copper River Delta are really important for migrating shorebirds. What else can we tell our viewers about wetland habitat? Well, what is a wetland? A wetland habitat. Let's break that in down to two parts, wetland and habitat. A wetland is a land with shallow water or waterlogged soil for much of the year. Here in the Copper River Delta, we have a couple different kinds of wetlands. This is a mud flat. It's a long, sloping, vast expanse of mud, and the ocean tide goes up and back along the shore. 
As the tide moves, the shorebirds move with it. They feed right along the water line, poking their bills in the mud for those little critters we're going to find out about later. The shorebirds also like the expanse of the openness of the mud flat. They can tell if predators are on their way, and they can flock up and swarm, and it's a beautiful display. Another kind of wetland we have here on the Copper River Delta is salt marsh. Way off in the distance, you can see the sedge and grass of the salt marsh. There are other birds that like that kind of wetland. Ducks and geese are adapted to eat the wetland plants there, like sedge and grass. So we've seen a couple different kinds of wetlands here on the Copper River Delta. Hmm, but are there more kinds of wetlands besides mudflats and marshes? I think there are more other types of wetlands. There are. Remember, we've been talking about stopovers. This is a staging area. That's what it's also called. At places like these, the shorebirds come just for a few days to rest and refuel so they get enough energy to continue migrating. We've talked about the Arctic tundra. Well, that's a wetland habitat, too. Shorebirds nest, breed, and raise chicks there. The shorebirds' winter homes in Mexico and Central and South America are also wetland habitats. There's a lot of ways that shorebirds use wetland habitats. Let's take a look at a video right now to learn more about that. Shorebirds depend on healthy, abundant chains of wetland habitats as they migrate thousands of miles each year. What is a wetland again? Well, a wetland is any land with certain wet characteristics, like shallow water or large damp and open areas. Swamps, bogs, and marshes are examples of wetlands. Wetlands also have lots of different kinds of food for shorebirds. You could think of them as hotels and restaurants for migrating birds. The wetlands here at the Copper River Delta are just one important stopover or staging area on the shorebirds' yearly migration. On the mudflats of the Chugach National Forest, shorebirds find a buffet of yummy marine clams and worms to eat and undisturbed land on which to rest. Then it's off to the Arctic tundra, the breeding area, where shorebirds have only two months to nest and raise their chicks. And of course, eat lots of insects. When the cold, cold tundra air returns in August, the shorebirds fly back south, wetland hopscotching along the way to rest and refuel. Finally, they reach their winter habitat in Sonola, Mexico, where they stay until spring. Obviously, the Copper River Delta isn't the only stop along the shorebird's annual journey. They stop at various wetlands along their flyway, to and from their breeding grounds. These wetlands might be found at neighborhood parks, farms like this one, national wildlife refuges, and other national forests, like the Jugach National Forest. Western sandpipers like Maya fly in 250-mile hops from one wetland to the next, so you can imagine that if just one of those wetlands was destroyed, the whole population could be in danger. Sadly though, many of the wetlands shorebirds rely on are becoming polluted or destroyed, making migration even more difficult for shorebirds. What can you do? Stay tuned for ideas on how you can protect wetlands. Hi, got that? There are all kinds of different wetlands at different stopover areas, nesting areas, and wintering areas. Now we're going to go back to Virginia, where Sandy and Hillary are going to give us a closer look at Maya's wintering habitat, Sinaloa, Mexico, and why we need wetlands, too. Thanks, Pam and Mariah. We can't wait to see about the bird count and join some shorebirds for a meal in just a bit. We've learned about wetlands and, our, and their home for shorebirds, but how do wetlands help us? I think Mrs. Poppy students has some ideas why humans need wetlands, too. Wetlands filter pollutants. That's right, John. Wetlands are just like a strainer, and wetlands filter debris or contaminants that can harm life downstream. But, but too much pollution can damage wetlands, too. Wetlands provide water. That's right, Jordan. Everybody needs water. Wetlands help keep it clear and clean. Wetlands prevent flooding. Jordan. Wetlands do soak up uh, extra water, you're right, and so it, uh, it doesn't flood our towns and our cities. When conditions are dry, wetlands also help absorb moisture so we don't run out of water either. Provide food, like rice. 
great. That's that's exactly right, Jordan. Rice is grown in wetlands. Cranberries is grown in wetlands. As well as we'll learn today, shorebird food grows in wetlands too. Wetlands are homes and resting places to animals. That's right, Carrie. Wetlands are fabulous places to go watch wildlife. People visit wetlands to see animals like ducks, turtles, fish, and beaver. Make sure you stay on the trail so the animals have their space protected too. You can see that we depend on wetlands too. Now back to the shorebirds, so where my and other shorebirds live during the winter. As Pam was explaining, many shorebirds we have been seeing have an important wintering habitat in Central and South America, as our, our map indicates. Maya, who's in western uh, Sandpiper, lives in Sinaloa, Mexico, right here. You know, and right now, Hillary, we have Hico Vega Picos, a wildlife biologist and professor from the Tec de Monterrey on the phone from Sinaloa, Mexico. Hola, Hico, are you with us on the phone? Si, sí, I'm here. Can uh, you hear me? I can Hola. hear you fine. I can hear you fine. What's it like there? Oh, weather is being just uh, really hot here. Oh. <laughs> Good. Very hot. Well, Hiko, we're so glad that you're with us. Could you tell us something, uh, us and all our viewers, about Sinaloa and the wintering habitat for many shorebirds? We'll show some video of Sinaloa while you, while you talk. Okay, sure. Um, let's say Sinaloa is um, one of the 32 states in Mexico. It is located in Mexico's northwest coast. Uh, and Sinaloa has uh, one of the most important wetlands in Mexico. This wetland is Santa Maria Bay. It's a large uh, coastal lagoon made of uh, mangrove forests and tidal mudflats. Uh, it provides important wetland habitat for millions of birds, including dogs, herons, gulls, and of course, shorebirds. This year we have more than 700,000 shorebirds, most of them uh, western sandpipers, and they spend their winter in this bay. That's about 13% uh, of the, all the shorebirds in the Pacific flyway. And uh, let's say for the past uh, 15 days, I have been flying over Santa Maria Bay with other scientists uh, looking at the habitat. Uh, from the air, we can see that some of the wetlands are being taken over by stream farms. That is the, one of the biggest challenges for shorebirds that depend on this habitat. We are trying to find finding ways to help stream farmers and protect shorebird habitats. Uh, Santa Maria Bay is an important wintering area for shorebirds, but it's also a stopover in the Pacific Flyway. Shorebirds that winter farther south stop here to rest and refuel on their way to and from Panama and South America. Um, for all these large amount of shorebirds that winter here, Santa Maria Bay has been declared recently as an hemispheric site by the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network. Well, that's wonderful, Hiko. What other types of migratory birds besides western sandpipers use the wetlands in Santa Maria Bay? Well, we have uh, a lot of birds, like the blue-footed booby, uh, elegant terns, brown pelicans live here all year, and also nest here. But uh, shorebirds migrate north to nest and return here to Sinaloa every year in the fall. Well, Hiko, what kinds of research do you do in Sinaloa, and, and why do you do it? Oh, we're trying to do a different um, research here, mm, like this uh, radio tagging uh, western sandpipers and dowagers. We attach transmitters to their backs with a little bit of glue, and uh, this is a trinational effort with other organizations, and we're trying to learn in where they stop over during migration and how long. We also collect data about the uh, nest of certain species like the elegant tern and the snowy plovers and some other species, and this kind of research helps us to protect uh, their habitat. Well, Hiko, what do the kids in your area do to help the birds and protect the wetlands in Sinaloa? That's a good question. Uh, we have been working with them for the past two years. We know that, that they talk about birds with their parents and encourage them to protect the birds. We also know that they hesitate now to eat the bird's eggs because now they understand the importance of their birds and their habitat. Well, Sinaloa is sure an important place for shorebirds. Thanks so much, Hiko, for being with us today. Okay, well, the answers have been just pouring in for the next clue, and we have a winner. But first, Mrs. Poppy's class, what's the answer? Predators! Good job. That's exactly right. Animals that threaten shorebirds are called predators. Ron, do we have a winner? We have a winner. Again, the responses came in very, very quickly. But the first response came in from Ms. Barden Hagen's science class, 
Benton Middle School, Manassas, Virginia. Congratulations. Oh, great. All right, that's wonderful. It's a hometown favorite. You've won this wonderful Shorebird Puppet along with the two videotapes and all the other cool prizes for your classroom. Way to go, good job. Now don't forget that you want to save the P, E, D, and T with your earlier letters to fill in the mystery slogan. Now for the next clue, and I want to add that when you send in your email response, be sure to put your name, your email address, and uh, the state that you're from. Okay, are we ready for the next clue? Where do shorebirds rest and refuel during migration? Mm. These places are also called staging areas. Okay, folks, put your thinking caps in on, fill in those letters and get your answer in. Great, thanks Sandy. I just heard that the groups that went out exploring um, in Alaska have come back, so why don't we head back to the Copper River Delta and see what they've learned. Welcome back. Mr. Bowden and his students have been returning from their shorebird safari. Hi. How did you count the birds? Well, what we did today, we didn't have to go very far. They're, they're just right here. And what we had, we have repaired up, and each one of these uh, teams picked a different flock to work with. Several flocks actually were showing up out here. And then what we did, well, I'll let, I'll let Olivia tell you. Well, our group, we just took we, a group of about 20 birds, and then we counted about how many more groups there were of that same size. Right. And uh, how did your method work for you, Kara? We used the transect method. Transect method. How did that work? We used the transect method to count all the birds up top, across, and all the birds in the sides, then multiply it. Multiply. That's what we did. We had these small areas and then we multiplied across the area of this uh, entire delta. What we also did was we took some pictures, um, digital pictures, and then what we do is we go back and plug them into the computer um, and then we're able to get a real accurate count of how many birds are really there and then we then are able to figure how much we're off, you know, plus or minus a percentage error and then we can calculate a little bit better as to how many birds are on this Hartney Bay area. How many birds did you guys predict are out here using those methods? Wow, that seems like a lot of birds. What do you think? But those are only a few of the birds that are on the Copper Road Delta today. Biologists measure that there are over 100,000 today. Huh. But shorebirds are really hard to count because they fly around so much. Well, what we're going to do with our data is we're now going to get, once we get it into the computer, we're going to send it to the Shorebird Sister School project, and we're going to share that information with them. That data is real important for helping scientists to decide what to do with habitat. You people that live along the Pacific um, uh, migration route can really help us out a lot. If you would also send any counts that you see, this year, next year, they're always active on this site. There's a lot of discussion groups, and uh, it's a real interesting educational project. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Mr. Bowden. Hey, we're going to go back to the studio, and when we come back, we're going to join Belle Mickelson and her group that are looking at what shorebirds eat. Marvelous mud meals. Mm-mm. Sure does look like there's a lot of sandpipers at the Copper River Delta today. It's been a great day. Ron has been on the internet looking at where migratory birds are right now all over the country. You see, other species of shorebirds are using the different flyways that we talked about earlier. Um, remember, remember, if we look at the map, we, looked at, we talked about the Atlantic Flyway and the Central Flyway. And if you're in the Prairie Pothole region of the United States, that's be about right in here. It would include such states as Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Minnesota in the United States. And then the Central Flyway continues on up into Canada and includes the Canadian provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and people there along the Central Flyway are seeing the white one ramp white rump sandpiper and willets. They're on their way to the Canadian Arctic. On the east coast, along the Atlantic Flyway, we have species like red knots, which are journeying all the way from down here in Argentina and South America, coming all the way up here, stopping at Delaware Bay, then moving on to the Bay of Fundy, and finally ending up in the Hudson Bay in just a few weeks in Canada, where they're going to nest. Take a look at this map. Can you see which flyway you're on? All wow. right, Sandy. There are sure a lot of shorebird activity going on during migration. Okay, let's go back to Alaska and join Belle and the students at looking at that mud flat meal. Hello, welcome back to the Cobb River Delta. 
We're back with those marvelous mud meals. I can't wait. Bal, will you give us an idea about what the shorebirds are eating and what equipment you've used? Well, this is the amazing thing that, is, that we find out here on the Delta is that in a, in a little cubic inch, there's 40,000 organisms. It's, it's almost, it's unbelievable, it really is. So we've been looking on this and we actually even brought some of our mud pizzas today to show you. If you come look closely, you can see the bird tracks in here and also the bird bills. They are going so fast. It's just like little so sewing machines. And uh, that's what we've been using some of our sampling equipment to try to see what's happening there. Scientists have found that they can actually, the biomass that's in this uh, mud is less. So another, the number of critters is measurably less once these thousands and millions of birds have gone through every year. So it's, it's something really amazing. And we're gonna sh we've got collected some organisms and we're going to show you uh, what we found in just a few minutes. Great. Well, we'll get a look at some of the equipment they used and a closer look at the invertebrates themselves later. Yeah, who knows what an invertebrate is? I do. It's an animal without a backbone. Oh, cool. Well, anyway, they're, they're my favorite critters, those invertebrates. So, <laughs> Well, we're going to go to a, back to the table to get a closer look at these critters. Okay, Hillary, Sandy, back to you. Come right back. All right, thanks, Pam. Can't wait to learn more about those invertebrates. Who in the world would have thought that the mudflats were home to so many critters? It's amazing. Oh, or the, that the shorebirds have to eat so much on their journeys. Gosh, if you were a shorebird, those mudflats would look like a Thanksgiving Day table full of food. Ooh, yeah. Can you imagine eating so many of those invertebrates <laughs> that you'd nearly double your weight? Oh, the invertebrates the students are finding live at different depths in the mud. Shorebirds with short bills probe for animals that live near the surface, and those with longer bills reach animals that live deeper in the mud. In other words, shorebird bills are adapted for certain kinds of food. And did you know that the shorebird's droppings actually fertilize the mud so that the wetland stays healthy? Wow, that's neat. Okay, let's get back to Alaska and see some of the shorebirds' favorite meals. All right, let's go. Welcome back. We're going to look at some shorebird munchies, their favorites. Belle, will you give us an up-close and personal look at these critters? I sure will, and I have some students here ready to explain what we've been finding. Emily, you want to start out? These are caddisfly larvae. They build their own homes on their back, and shorebirds like to eat them as well as fish. Okay, that sounds pretty tasty. How about this? These critters are called polychaete worms. Polly means many and Kate means feet. They're favorite to most shorebirds. Yeah, they look they look pretty pretty fun to eat. Oh, my favorite is coming up next. These are Mokomo clams. Dunlins like them a lot. They usually eat these before any other things. Cool. I like clams. I, I bet a lot of you like clam chowder too. Okay, our next critter, Justin. These are amphipods. Mo many people um, call them shrimp. Yeah, and uh, I, I can see these are I, shorebirds, and we, we eat a lot of the same foods, don't we? Okay. These are stickleback fish. Good, and sticklebacks are just some of the fit types of fish that we found there. I think, Rachel, do you have another uh, fish here? Um, sculpin? This little fish is a sculpin. Yeah, and we're, uh, we also find salmon here. Th these kinds of wetland habitats are really the reason our fishing town exists is because of of all the wonderful habitat. And uh, without all these munchies and critters and these wonderful mud meals, these kids, these uh, kids, the shorebirds, wouldn't have enough to finish uh, their migration and go to nest. And so we're, this is such a great uh, habitat for the birds and for us too. <laughs> thanks, Val, and thanks everybody for showing us those critters. They sure don't top my list of favorite foods, but hey, the shorebirds seem to like them. Now, after the shorebirds get their fill, they're going to head on up to the, mi to the Arctic tundra. They're going to finish their migration. And then what will they do, Mariah? Nest and breed and raise up to three or four chicks. That's right. It's a cycle. And the cycle has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. And as long as the shorebirds have healthy chains of wetland habitats, the shorebirds will continue to make those magnificent migrations. 
From the Arctic tundra, the shorebirds will head back down south to Central or South America or Mexico, and they'll spend their winter months there. Those are wetland habitats too, remember? And then there's the Arctic tundra. That's a wetland habitat, and when they go back up there in the spring, they'll stop at important places. These habitats called stopovers, like the Copper River Delta on the Chugach National Forest. But as we've seen, the journey is a dangerous one, and it's made difficult more by humans sometimes, polluting water and altering habitat. Mariah, I think you had a question for Dan. Mr. Logan, what can these students do to help protect the shorebirds on their migration? Well, Mariah, let's ask some of your classmates and see. Maybe Cody, you might have something. Learn more about local shorebirds and wetlands. Excellent idea. And then you can take some of this knowledge and you can write an article for your local newspaper, or you could even write your own news newsletter. How about another one, Rachel? Be a biologist. Hey, now I like that idea. You can, take your, you can monitor birds right in your backyard, or you can look at birds in the wetlands, and then you can send those observations into things like the Shorebird Sister Schools program, or even the Cornell Lab. Not only is it a lot of fun to do, but it helps biologists get a better understanding about these birds. How about another one? How about Ben? Observe signs and enjoy shorebirds from a distance. Great idea. You know, a lot of shorebird habitat down south, people like to go to those beaches too. So if you go there, give the birds a lot of room, look at them with a pair of binoculars, and keep a good distance. How about another one? How about Victoria? Adopt a wetland on public or private land. Great idea. You know, you can, you can also help land managers plant trees or some of the local vegetation. Well, thanks, you guys. You came up with some great ideas, great ways to protect wetlands. And that also helps birds during their migration. Remember, shorebirds and a lot of other animals depend on wetland habitat. So anything you do to help wetlands helps them. So find out about some of the wetlands in your, habitat, in your area. Who knows, maybe a local park or farmland might provide some great wetland habitat. Or you could take your family to a national forest or Fish and Wildlife Service refuge, and then you could look at some of the wetland habitats there. Now these public places, just like the Chugach National Forest, they belong to all of us. And a lot of critters, like moose and bears and wolves, they all make their homes on these public lands. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. Hillary, Sandy, I bet you have a winner for that next clue. Any clothing thoughts before we go to questions? Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Dan. That's really interesting. And we do have a winner for the last coup. Ron, who is it? I'm impressed. The answers are coming in in piles and coming in quickly. The, the winner to this particular clue is North Fork Academy, North Fork, Virginia. Congratulations, North Fork Academy. Great. All right. All right. And I bet Mrs. Poppy's class has the answer to the clue. Stopovers. That's right, yes, migratory birds rest and refuel at stopovers. Congratulations on winning the prizes, and remember everyone to keep the S, O, and E from that clue with your other letters to solve the mystery slogan. Now, the final clue. Every spring, shorebirds head north to the Arctic blank to rest and breed. That's right, to nest and breed. And we gave you some help with these word Arctic. And remember that the letter C is shaded, so you need that for the mystery slogan. So get your guesses in. Thanks, Hillary. We're also getting closer to the time when you get to challenge us with your questions. But before we do that, let's talk about what we've learned today. Gosh, we've covered a lot of ground, just like the shorebirds do from Mexico, up the Pacific Flyway, and on to Alaska. We've talked to our friends in Sinaloa, Mexico, where the western sandpipers began their migration, and we talked to our good friends in Alaska who saw the same birds at the Copper River Delta, a stopover site. We learned that shorebirds need a chain of wetlands as they migrate so they can rest and refuel along the way, and we took a close look at shorebirds' adaptations, what they eat, how many there are, and we visited their wetland homes in different countries. And don't forget, folks, wetlands are important for our health, too. We also learned how we can make a difference for shorebirds in their wetland environments. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on this journey. Our electronic adventure isn't over yet, so stay tuned for more. And remember to go to the website to learn 
to continue to learn more about shorebirds and migration at shorebirds.pwnet.org. You can also view the entire program as a streaming video on the Internet for one month following the broadcast. Check it out on the web. We're going to have a five-minute break, and after the break, we're going to answer your questions, so go ahead and call 800-228-6302 to talk directly to us, or you can also send an email to Ron. Your question's in at pwnetwk at aol.com. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We've been getting lots of questions, and we will get to them right after we uh, give the answer to our final clue. And the winner, what was the answer, students? Tundra! All right, yes, tundra, of course. Every spring, shorebirds head north to the Arctic to nest and breed. Breed. Ron, who is the winner? The winner to this clue is Standish Sterling Middle School, Standish, Michigan, Mrs. Bartlett's fifth grade class. Congratulations. All right. That's great. All the way from Michigan, you too have won uh, this bird, great bird puppet, along with the two videotapes and the activity guide here. And, uh, and you'll get this poster to display in your classroom as well, as well. Way to go. Now, you have all the letters you need to fill in the blanks to our mystery slogan. Now, here they are on the screen. Unscramble those letters and email your answer. The first one to do wins our grand prize. Remember the big, giant shorebird? Videos and classroom materials. Let's start taking questions now. Okay, you know, I think our first call is from Norfolk, Virginia. Okay, Norfolk, what's your question? Okay, um, some people say that shorebirds have an internal magnet to help them migrate. Is this true, and if it's not, how do they know when and where to fly? Okay, good question, good question. The question was, some people say that shorebirds have an internal magnet or maybe even like a compass that helps them migrate. The question was, is that true, and uh, how does it work for them? I think we should uh, pitch that to Alaska and see if our Alaskan friends could answer that. Excellent question. You know, the shorebirds are kind of interesting because up on the breeding grounds, that's one of, they're one of the few species or actually bird groups where the adults will migrate out before the young. So it is instinctual. But it's not just a magnet. They use a lot of things. They're looking at the stars and the map. You know, they kind of have a map in their head, just like you do when you're driving in your car and you're holding the map while your mom or dad's driving. Great. Great. That's a great answer, Dan. Thank Super. you very much. Super. You know, our next question is going to be from Mrs. Poppy's class. How long is the life of a shorebird? Great. So how long is the life of a shorebird? Dan? Bell, can you tell us? Out. I can answer that question. Shorebirds live about four or five years, but there's been some reports of some even living to 14. Oh, so it really varies. Thank you. Wow, Thanks. Some of those That's can live great. A long time. Oh, super. Okay. Our next uh, question is from Gerard Middle uh, School in Illinois. Okay, Gerard Middle School, what's your question? What would the birds do if there was a storm? Oh, good question. The question is, what would the birds do if there was a storm? Now, I know the folks in Cordova can help us with that. Definitely. Let's go yeah. to find out. Uh, well, that, that's, that's a good question, too, because if it's storm, the birds are just going to be doing just like what you would do if there was a storm. They're going to hide, and they're going to stick close to shore where they can, um, you know, eat and also and hang out. And in fact, here in Cordova, um, we don't think we've seen as many shorebirds this year here in Hartney Bay is because it's been such great weather that they're all going out uh, past Egg Island and in the islands of the Sound. But uh, if, uh, if, uh, if it's really bad weather, that's when you see the huge clouds of shorebirds here because they hang out in Hartney Bay until the weather clears, and then you get millions and millions flying up in the sky. So anyway, that's the difference between good and bad weather. Boy, I remember those big storms in Cordova. Oh, wow, okay. I can't imagine. And we have another cl uh, question from Mrs. Poppy's students. How much does a shorebird weigh? So how much does a shorebird weigh? Great question. Another good one. <laughs> um, the shorebirds weigh about 25 grams. They're not very heavy. You hold one in your hand, you'd be surprised at how light they are. That's about the, about the weight of a quarter. Six quarters, actually. Six quarters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So those little westerns are, are pretty small. OK, we have our next call from Windsor, Virginia. Windsor, what's your question? When, I mean, do we have the birds that y'all are talking about in the eastern states? Oh, good question. Do we have the birds, the little western sandpipers, that we're talking about right here? Let's, 
We're going to answer that one here. Sure, okay. Sure. We sure do have a number of uh, shorebirds that are actually migrating through right now. And then we have a number of shorebirds that, that are here all year. In fact, you may have heard of the killdeer. That's a very popular bird you might even see in your schoolyard. And, and the great way to see if, uh, know if you've got a killdeer is when you hear birds fly. And if it says, killdeer, killdeer, then you probably have a killdeer in your area. So, yes, we have shorebirds on the East Coast. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Okay, we, now we have a call from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, what's your question? If, can, why do they need to eat so much if they couldn't get any on the way? Couldn't they get food on the way? Okay, the question is, can they get food along the way, and can, why do they have to eat so much? Okay, let's go to Cordova, Alaska, and see if they can answer that let's for see us. That. Sure. Those birds stop at several places they'll stop. You know, they come up the Pacific Coast, they're going to stop in San Francisco Bay and then around Seattle and then Canada. And when they stop, they eat a tremendous amount of food. It'd be kind of like if you were getting ready to, to leave San Diego or where's, I'm not sure where this call was from, but say you left the West Coast, you left San Diego and went up to San Francisco. It'd be like you running up there all in a couple of days and then stopping and you'd have to eat probably 50 pounds of peanut butter to run the rest of the way. And one, one reason that this delta is so important is if you look on a map or if you fly in a plane from uh, the west coast, the whole time you're just going to see mountains and glaciers. So there aren't any mud flats until you get to the Copper River Delta for birds to eat. So this delta is really important. It's really a critical habitat they for can, the birds. They can double their weight here. Yeah, That's double their double weight. weight. It's real good form. And we figured out in our activities, I don't know if anybody did the activities, but uh, to for an 80-pound student to eat uh, a McDonald's hamburger every 10 minutes, uh, it, it would take them 2,016 hamburgers to uh, double their weight. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> oh, great! I don't think I could eat that many. Okay, now we have an email question. So, Ron, can you handle that? Yeah, this question is from Wellington Junior High School in Wellington, Colorado, and the question is this. Are there any shorebirds that migrate east and west in addition to north and south? Mm. Ooh, good, good one for question. Dan. Should yeah. we send it back oh, to yeah. Alaska? <laughs> okay, Dan, help us out here. I'll do it. Yeah. No, there isn't. All these shorebirds here in the western hemisphere, they're all north-south migrators. There's not any of these birds that migrate east to west. They'll sometimes move a little bit east to west on their flight, but they're staying within their flyways, either the Pacific Flyway or all the way over in the Atlantic, and then the flyways in between. I think the Hawaiian birds that migrate up yeah. here are even moving directly north yeah. to the, Alaska, not too far to the east. Yeah, the, the Pacific Golden Plover would be the closest one that's kind of going to north-south. It's coming from Hawaii to Alaska. That's still a, a, called a north-south migration. Great, super. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, we have a caller from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, what's your question? Are you there, Missoula? Okay. <laughs> no. Are you there, Missoula? Hello? Yes. All right. I'm from Manassas, what's Virginia. Okay, Manassas. Okay. Go ahead, Manassas. Okay. I would like to know how many um, migrations a shorebird makes in one lifetime. How many times does the shorebird migrate in a lifetime? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. And I think our friends in Cordova can help yeah, us out with that one, too. Yeah, I think so, too. too. Let's All see. Right. Okay. Somebody, you want that one? You sure. It. Kind of a multiplication problem. It's if they, they migrate north and then they migrate south, and as Pam told us, that if they migrate five times, they live five years, then that would be ten times, and some of them, if they can get to 14 times, we're going to get 28 migrations out of them. That's if you count the trip up and the trip south as separate trips. And I think those birds kind of count those as separate trips. Long flights. 7,000 miles. That's a lot of miles. That, that is. is. And the cool thing that Dan was telling us just before the show started was that some of these shorebirds actually, <clears throat> uh, the young ones, make that trip with, without uh, the adults along. They come later than the, than the adults. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something that's in their brains. <laughs> Well, you guys are doing great yeah. with your questions. These are yeah. just wonderful. Okay, our next call is from Seymour, Connecticut. Seymour, what's your question? If birds eat a lot before uh, they migrate, do they get cramps and stomach aches? 
Ooh, <laughs> great good question. question. <laughs> kind of like we do before yeah. soccer or something and eat too much. Good okay. question. Okay, the question is if birds eat so much as they're migrating, do they get cramps and stomach aches, kind of like we do? Okay, I think that's a Cordova question. Yeah, yeah. Let's find out. <laughs> Boy, I sure would get a stomach ache if I ate that much for those favorite sherbet munchies. But sherbets are adapted to eat that much. We can't eat a huge barrel of peanut butter and then run a couple of marathons. But shorebirds can put on that body fat very easily because they're adapted for those long migrations. Great. That is fascinating. We, we now have a, a question from a student in Mrs. Poppy's class. Are, are the birds the same color? Are the birds the same color? I think we can do that right here. There's actually a, a variety of species of shorebirds, and they're all different colors. But the one thing they have in, column, in common is that their, their plumage is all generally colors that help them blend in to their habitat. So they're going to be browns and oranges and, and beiges and so forth. And then there's some uh, birds that are exceptionally colorful, and they'll have some red on them, and, uh, and some of them have bright pink legs. So there is a lot of variation. They're, they're really fascinating. And what I'd recommend is you pick up a, um, go to your, your uh, library, your student library at your school, and um, look at a bird identification guide and go to the shorebird section and just take a peek at all the different shorebirds there are that, that uh, migrate through this area. It's really fascinating. Great, Hillary. Yeah. Shorebirds can be kind of subtle, but they sure are beautiful. They are. They're beautiful. Okay, our next question is an email question. So, Ron, what's our question? This question comes from North, North Fork Academy, North Fork, Virginia, and the question is, do most flocks live through their migration journey? Oh, good, good. question. Do yeah. most flocks, yeah. most birds, live, make it through that migration journey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to Cordova. Yeah. They can answer that for us. Yeah, I, I can't remember the exact figure on how many birds make it. Uh, a good number of them do. You know, when we look at our staging area here, most of these birds that stop here migrate out. I, I would guess that probably say within the birds here, maybe a little over 90% survive and make it up to the wintering ground. That's kind of a guess. I'd have to look that up. Super, Dan. Thank you. And now we have a caller from Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, what's your, your question? Can shorebirds go to one place and then go back to Alaska and come back to the next same place in spring? Okay, when shorebirds migrate and they go to Alaska, are they going back and forth to the same place? I think that's a good, another good question for Dan. We want to go to Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> I think those birds do generally head back to the same areas. There might be some, some birds that stray off with another flock and end up someplace different than they started, but generally they are pretty well imprinted with where they want to go home to and where they want to summer. They like those areas quite a bit. That's great. You, you folks are just doing a great job with your questions. Yeah. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. You haven't stumped us yet. Okay, our next question is from Mrs. Poppy's class. What's your question? Is there such thing as an eastern sandpiper? Oh, great question. I don't know. Do you want to handle that, Hillary, or sure. should we go to Alaska? No, uh, okay. We actually don't have a shorebird called the eastern sandpiper. So there are some other species that look similar to a western sandpiper, but we don't have any named eastern sandpiper. But excellent question. That's great. Wow, these are great. Yeah. Okay, our next, our next question is from Benton Middle School in Prince William County. So right here and where we're broadcasting from the studio today. Okay, what's your question? How long was the longest distance a shorebird has ever traveled? Ooh, how long is the longest distance a shorebird has ever traveled? Wow. I think that's a great Alaska question. Yeah. Let's go see what they have to say. Red knots travel 14,000 miles. That's a long ways. They come way up to Alaska from, is it New Zealand? Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> That's it from Alaska. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we now have a call from Mesquite, Texas. Mesquite, Texas, what's your question? Hello, Mesquite. Um, do their, does the parents stay with the babies after they're born? Good question for them. Okay, do the parents stay with the chicks after they're born? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's ask the shorebird experts in Cordova. <laughs> 
Well, uh, yes, uh, one parent at least stays with the chicks after they're born. Uh, as in most, in shorebirds, in fact, it's a little different because there's quite a number of shorebirds where it's the dad that stays with the, the chicks after they're born instead of the mother. So, uh, but it's, it varies depending on the species. Okay, great, great. Okay, we're going to go to Mrs. Poppy's class for one of their questions. What coastal states do shorebirds live in? Ooh, what coastal states do shorebirds live in? Wow. Should we go to Alaska? Well, yeah. Okay, let's, do let's that. see if Dan and the okay. crew can help us out. Well, the coastal states that they live in, of course, is Alaska, and this is where they nest. And then they'll migrate all the way down the Pacific coast. So they'll live and they'll stop for a short time in Washington. And some birds, like a killdeer, they'll nest down in Washington. Then they'll go through Oregon, Oregon, Calif yep. California. Oregon, California, and then Mexico. All right. And on the Atlantic fly, we, ha we have a number of shorebirds, like the piping plover, that will nest um, in uh, Virginia, North Carolina, on up to New Jersey. A number of shorebirds will um, spend the winter along the Texas coast. And, um, and, and so we do have a number of species that are also in the coastal states of the United States. Okay, I guess we have an email question, Ron. The question comes from Mrs. Pollitt's sixth grade science class from Girard, Illinois. The question is, why do shorebirds' feathers change color? Ooh. Oh, good question. Yeah, great. I think, I think our experts in, in Alaska can, can help us with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, the reason is is that it attracts their mate. They uh, are able to identify the right species that they're supposed to be with that way. And also, they like those feathers the birds do. So they kind of see it as a way of dressing up, wearing makeup, or just generally looking good. <laughs> and, and a lot of migratory birds, you know, when you think about how far they travel, they beat up their feathers pretty good. So if you look at shorebirds and waterfowl and a lot of other birds, They'll replace their feathers once a year, spring and fall, both times. And that helps them keep their feathers in good shape so they can make those migrations. Great. Great. Fabulous. That's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, our next call is from Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, do you have your question? What's your question? Um, how, many, how many food does a bird eat before they migrate? Oh, good question. How much food does a bird eat before it migrates? You know, the Cordova folks spent a lot of time looking at those mud meals. That's right. Let's go back to them yeah. and see if Belle maybe could help us out. Yeah. Belle or whoever. Go ahead, Belle. Well, I don't know. I guess we know how many hamburgers a bird would eat in <laughs> 2016, but I don't know. But you can imagine it must be a pile, huge pile. Well, if you want... Go ahead. If you watched a couple of birds and you watched that sewing machine motion with their bills, if they could pick up one critter with each of those probes in the mud, they would be pretty full and that would be a lot to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's a project that some of these people watching the show would want to take on as they yeah, for a science Yeah, it's pretty amazing to think year. about. We now have yeah, a call from idea. Montana, Missoula. Montana, Missoula, what's your question? Um, do western sandpipers dive under and grab their food like ducks? Ooh, oh. good question. Do western do west sandpipers yes, dive under the water and catch, catch their food like, like ducks, ducks or swans or geese do? Yeah. We've got some duck, geese, swan experts, experts. in Alaska. Let's yeah. go at, talk to them. I'll do it. Okay. Well, no, they don't. Shorebirds are actually pretty specialized, and there's a lot of variety within shorebirds. You have some birds like the curlews with the long recurved bill, and they'll partition out in a certain kind of habitat where the water's a little bit deep, but they still don't dive. Ducks, d ducks and waterfowl, now they'll have a whole different feeding strategy. You know, you can have some ducks that feed on the surface and some ducks that dive, but shorebirds, they're all just feeding right at the tide line here, pretty shallow water. They don't dive at all. Great. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, now it's time to see who our grand prize winner is, and we'll get back to your questions in just a minute. You know, I bet we've got a winner. Kids, what is the mystery slogan? Protect wetlands. Uh -huh. You know, that's one of the points we've been talking about all day long today. So, Ron, tell us, who's the grand prize winner? I know you've all been anxiously awaiting to see who the grand prize winner is, and there were a lot of quick responses. 
The first response came from Melissa Pinder, 7th grade class, Arthur Williams Middle School in Jessup, Georgia. Oh. Congratulations. That's wonderful. You guys get a really cool batch of presents and you get that wonderful shorebird. Uh, He's, you know, you can see him, he's about six feet tall. Enjoy that shorebird. Remember Cordova and all the shorebirds. I, you did a good job, thanks. Now we've got a little more time for questions. So our next question is from, where should we go? Can we, Mrs. Poppy, can we have a question from your class? What do they do for defense? Oh, what do shorebirds do for dis defense? You know, I think our friends in Cordova Absolutely. have some good answers yeah. for that. Let's the, go there. The, the shorebirds, what the, the beautiful displays we're seeing as they're flying around and they're making these beautiful patterns in the sky, what they're doing is they're trying to look not like one shorebird, but one giant organism. And so it, it, it fools the hawks and eagles and other predators that are after them. And also those large numbers help, as they're on the ground, divert other predators from getting at them. So the, the safety in numbers is how they're doing it. Great. Well, we understand safety in numbers, that's for sure. Um, okay, we have another caller from Manassas, Virginia. Manassas, go ahead with your question. Um, I, I want to know if there are any endangered species of shorebirds in North America. Oh, that's a great question. The caller wants to know if there's any endangered shorebirds in North America. And we actually have uh, a, a few endangered shorebirds, and they include the piping plover, the snowy plover, um, and the bristle-fied curlew. And then there's a number, a number of species that are species of special concern. That means they're not endangered yet, but their numbers are declining, so we're concerned about them, and we're doing special studies on them to learn more. Okay, well, it looks like we have another caller. And our next call is from Sterling Middle School in Michigan. Okay, Sterling, what's your question? So how many babies can shorebirds have? Ooh. How many babies can shorebirds have? You know, our Cordova friends uh, have an answer to that. Let's go back to Alaska. Sure. Shorebirds, you know, they're, they have a lot of diversity with them in terms of their size. But one thing all the species and all about the 80 species of shorebirds that we have are consistent in is they all lay about the same number of eggs. They'll lay four eggs per nest, and you can see that with just about all the species of shorebirds. Great. Good question. And we have another caller from Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach, go ahead. What's your question? Thank you. Your question? Go ahead, please. Okay. Our caller, we've lost okay. our caller. So, uh, Mrs. Poppy Class, do you have another uh, question for us? How old are shorebirds when they learn to fly? How old are shorebirds when they learn to fly? What a great question. That's a good one. I bet our Cordova friends can answer that. Let's go to yes. Dan and the crew. How about it, guys? Well, shorebirds jump out of the nest about three hours after they're hatched. And then within about a month and a half, they're learning to fly. They follow their parents around on the Arctic tundra, and they have a lot of insects to eat to get ready for their migration. And then they take off. and. They know where to go. It's a magical thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. You know, our next question is an email question. So, Ron, what's your question? This question comes from Jeff Catt, fifth grader from Standish Sterling Middle School. His question is, how many eggs do how many eggs does a shorebird have in one season? Okay. Oh. You know, I, I think the Cordova folks answered yeah. part of that. Yes. Let's just go back and, and see if they can add a little bit more to their answer. Okay. Sure, we can answer that question. Shorebirds normally lay four eggs, and most species will do that just once. But there are a couple species that lay several clutches, and a clutch is one group of, of eggs, usually four. I think there are some species where they continue to nest, the females may ha um, hatch out a clutch and then go on and find another mate. Thank you, Pam. We now have another call from Missoula, Montana. Missoula, go ahead. What's your question? What color are their eggs? Ooh, oh. what color are shorebird eggs? Oh, Let's ask good. our Cordova friends. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, one of the things shorebirds are really good at is camouflaging their eggs. In fact, if you're doing surveys, a lot of people up in Alaska where we're looking for shorebird nests up in the tundra, you can't hardly see their nests sometimes. They're so good. So those eggs are kind of speckled and camouflaged, and you've got to get pretty close to see them. That's another thing they do to keep predators from eating them. Great. Great. Okay. I'm sorry, folks, but our last question mm. is going to be from Miss, Miss, uh, Mrs. Poppy's class. So what's our last question of today? When walking on the sand, why do they run away from the waves instead of flying away from them? Oh. When walking on the sand, why do they run away from the waves instead of just flying away? That's a great question. Let's ask that last question back yeah. to Alaska. Well, those shorebirds are noodling around in the mud, and they're running back and forth because they want to get as many critters right along the water's edge. And they don't fly away because they want to keep on chowing down on those little invertebrates. Great. Well, that's fascinating. And while you guys were getting your questions answered, Ron has been writing up our, op our field observations from this broadcast. And he's making an email posting. And this message will be posted to over 900 students and educators and biologists around the world that all participants in the Shorebird Sister Schools Education Discussion Group. So we'll be telling them all about the species they saw, about the western sandpipers, where they come from, what they eat. And then everybody from that's on this listserv, all these shorebird enthusiasts will read about this and get to learn more and, and the shorebird sister schools program is a great way if you're excited about shorebirds after this broadcast this is the way to keep learning more it really is and you can become a, a member by um, sending me an email message at sssp at fws.gov and you'll also find a link on the um, on this broadcast website so if you want to continue learning about shorebirds, if you want to find out what shorebirds are seen in other parts of the world, like Australia and Russia and uh, Argentina, get involved with Shorebird Sister Schools. It's a lot of fun. Sandy? Oh, that's great. You know, there's one last thing. We've had such fun this afternoon. I'm glad you're with us. But there's one last thing that we really ask that you do. It's important for us to know how you like the program and what you'd like to see in the future. So we provided an easy way for you to let us know that. It's an online evaluation form. We're asking that you go to the website address on the screen, and there you'll find the evaluation form. Just fill it out and send it in. We really, really would like to hear what you think. Okay. Now, gosh, are we going back to Alaska I to say goodbye to the time. wonderful uh, yeah. Copper River Delta? I hate to say goodbye, but thanks for being with us. Good, smile, yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>